Welcome back for episode seven of Building This House Start to Finish here in the beautiful mountains of Western North Carolina. We left you last time building the big wall, the window wall, and as promised, it was no big deal. Man, are we gonna be doing that construction stuff again today? Like carrying wood and boards and stuff? Yeah. Man, I think I should probably head home. I'm not feeling too good. After convincing Jason that he was just fine, it was time to start putting on the house wrap. On this project, we're using HydroGap house wrap. It has these rubber nodules that leave a one millimeter gap between the siding and your house. This helps to eliminate moisture as well as being able to drain up to a hundred times more bulk water than your standard house wrap. Meanwhile, Arlo and I were framing up the gable end wall, which matches the roof pitch of 312 across the top. That means that each stud is a different length. We figure this length by using math. At 312 roof pitch with a 16 inch spacing makes each stud four inches longer than the previous one. Here's one super important step that I've seen a lot of people skip actually, is to straighten all of the exterior walls before you set a roof or a floor system on top of them, locking them in place. This wall was actually pretty crooked as you can see until we straightened it. There are several different methods you could use to do this, but what we're doing here is pulling a string line from one end of the wall to the other and spacing it off of the wall an inch and a half with these blocks. We'll then go down the length of the wall, checking the distance between the wall and the string line to make sure it's an inch and a half the whole way. Um, well, in a little, uh, out a little, well, um, try one screw there. All right, now let it loose. Okay. I think do go ahead and do the other one. Real man of genius stuff right there, bub. Once we had all of the exterior walls framed on this house, it was off to the races building the interior walls. All right, here we go. In, in the room. And you know, I think we- Fire in the hole! These interior walls don't need anchor bolts like the exterior walls because there's no uplift. We use a powder actuated nail gun to fasten them to the floor, uses a 27 caliber small little bullet with no bullet to fire the nail into the concrete. These nails have big washers so that they catch on the bottom plate very securely and they're pretty fun to use. On account of the stained concrete floor being the finished floor, we did not chalk our lines through the door openings for these interior walls. So that chalk line might not come off the floor you need to have a blue or red line across your finished floor in the finish. And just like our first concrete delivery, our truss truck drove hey right past our job site and was gone for about a half an hour before they finally came back around and found us. This driveway is kind of hidden and it's kind of been a problem. Yep. These delivery trucks are pretty cool. They have a set of rollers that can be moved up or down to roll the load off the back of the truck. I was super happy to see these floor trusses, but after closer inspection of the drawings, something was crazy. This is not what I expected. Turns out they had turned the trusses the opposite way than I had planned to, and on smaller projects, I think there is a chance for mistakes because you think it's so simple, you don't double check with the engineer, and I didn't. He ran these trusses to a wall that I was not planning on being load bearing. We had to call a structural engineer and run the loads for our slab to make sure it would carry the load before carrying on. Luckily it did. Teamwork. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Where, right, 66 year old man, this is a tough one. Where the heck does that go? I don't know. That is the smallest truss I've ever seen. One major note for setting trusses is they have a painted end. Make sure the painted end is facing the same way on all the trusses. The truss company will usually look out for you on this, but make sure you don't have a truss directly below a toilet. This won't work. Once the trusses were installed, it was straight on to applying the Advantech subfloor for the loft. We're using a quick drive drill here, and this makes it a lot faster and easier, and way easier on your back. We, of course, also are gluing the subfloor down, and actually, we usually use the Advantech brand subfloor glue, but our gun messed up, so we had to resort to the old subfloor adhesive. We used the simple technique of a sledgehammer and a block of wood to beat the tongue and groove tight on this Advantech sheeting and then screw it down. It's a pretty fast process on a floor this size. That's new. It wasn't like that before. All 
right, right. Everybody's wondering, but nobody's asking. How the heck did you grow a beard like that? You just gotta quit shaving. <laughs> I quit shaving. <laughs> a measure on this beard here. All right. All right, I'm gonna go chin to bottom, hairs. I'm gonna call it a solid three and a half. Mm. That is crazy. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's like, he's got you crushed six wow. inches. After lunch, Jono and Arlo were straight into stairs. And this is pretty amazing to be building the stairs the same day we built the floor. This doesn't happen every time. Since this is one straight run of stairs, we decided to screw the tops and the bottoms of the stringers together and make like a bridge, install the thing all in one piece. We also installed a board against the wall to space them off the wall an inch and a half. This gives room for a drywall and a finished skirt board to slide in behind the stair nosings so you don't have to cut around them with finished material. We made these stairs 44 inches wide, even though it's a small house, because I don't like narrow stairs. It's like a super highway from the top to the bottom. Next on the list was setting these posts and girders to carry the roof system out over the covered patio. We're using 5 8 inch anchor bolts that go down into this concrete slab to hold the post down against any uplift. This particular type of bolt uses a pin to spread the bottom of the bolt and wedge it tightly into the concrete to where it can't pull out. Unfortunately, here we had to take a little bit off the top of the pin with a grinder, about an eighth inch, so that the plate that goes over would actually sit tight. After using a laser and a tape measure to figure the heights of the posts, I took the 8x8 posts and cut a notch in the top that would receive the beam. A little extra step here for aesthetics, run a hand plane down each corner to knock the corner off, make it look nice and round and smooth. Who sharpened that? Ah, uh, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> this eight by eight post is way oversized for the load. I just wanted it to be big so it didn't look like a toothpick underneath this huge roof. Once the base of the post was fastened into the bracket, we used some 2x4 bracing to brace it plumb in both directions. Next it was time for the even taller post on the high side of the roof. This took a few more men as it was a several hundred pound post. And as I watched the guy stand the post up, it kind of reminded me of something. I'm not sure what it is, just something I've seen before. Uh, come in a little bit, a little more, a little more. Whoa. Yeah. Okay, that's good. After our posts were set, we simply made notches in the wall to carry the load of the other end of the beam. This is an easy way to do it. Then we attached the beam to the post with these structural screws. Dang! Man, how'd that feel, bud? Oh, wow. <laughs> Dude, give me an impact. You know what they say, that was one way to do it. That will definitely do it. How's she look? Dead nuts? Dead nuts. After the first layer of the beam, we added the second layer to make a total width of three and a half inches with this LVL beam to carry the roof load across this opening. With the posts and girders finished up, we still had daylight to burn, so we started working on some of the upstairs walls on the loft. This was another big wall, and I hated to miss out on lifting it, but someone's got to videotape this stuff so you can watch it. The reason the bottom plate of this wall wasn't sliding off the subfloor as they lifted it is Jamie had tacked it to the floor just like this with toenails. It's so important if you don't want your wall to slide, this acts as a hinge, you can stand the wall safely. 
So I've been looking for my impact driver for days. Uh, I lost it Monday, I think. Couldn't find it. <laughs> and uh, I think I just saw it on top of this hill. I've been coming way up here to shoot video and pictures of this project we're working on. And uh, whoa, I think I spotted it. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Woo! A little rusted. Still works though, and the battery's still good. Sweet. I've been, I've been doing this carpentry for like 45 years. This is the first house that on the third day, I never went up a ladder to go to the second floor. I just built the stairs and we went up there and we're walking up there. I think everybody went, maybe gone, went up the ladder two or three times, but other than that, done, Un unheard of. Usually you're at a job for a month and you're like, why don't we have the stairs? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the plumber usually says that. <laughs> Where are the stairs? <laughs> exactly. I don't know. Arla didn't build them yet. Uh, yeah, it's it awesome. It yeah, we've fun. really enjoyed this job. Uh, it's been good. It's been awesome. It's been good. Make sure to check back next week for episode eight, where we build the roof system. And we also pull the oldest trick in the book on Ray and on Arlo. And Jason screams a bunch of stuff. See ya. Yo, I need a full sheet today. Let's go. Come on. <laughs>